disappoint you but I only have three jokes today but one of them is as good as three of them okay you just wait and see okay let me get my little paper out because I can't remember them yeah you can tell a joke what's your joke what? okay I got one for you what kind of room doesn't have doors a mushroom. <laughs> a mushroom. Okay. Why was the broom late? Think about it. He overswept. <laughs> okay. This is this is more of a one-liner kind of a thing. I mean, it's not a one-liner, but this is the joke that's as good as three. Okay. So, two cows were talking to each other in a field, right? And one of them said to the other, Man, have you heard of that mad cow disease going around? You know, it makes you forget who you are and everything. It's, it's just bad. And the other cow looked at him and he said, Yeah, it makes me glad I'm a chicken. <laughs> I appreciate that, guys. I appreciate that. I have something to show you if I can find it. If, yes, I can. All right. Can y'all tell me what this is? It's a battery. It's a battery. Good job. It is a big battery. The bigger, the more expensive. I hope so. So, what are batteries used for? So you might need one, maybe not like this, but you need one for like maybe a toy or, yeah. What if, okay, I know y'all know what this is because y'all and y'all electronic stuff. No, hold on, hold on. What if you see something like this? You know what that means? Dead battery. Dead, dead, dead. That means a dead battery. What if you see on your iPad or whatever, you see this? What does that mean? I mean, you said it means dead battery, but what does that mean you can do with it? You can charge it. What if you don't have a charger? <laughs> so if you have this battery, but it's a dead battery, 
it can't be used for anything, right? You can't use what is what you're we're gonna put in it for. And if my phone has a dead battery, my phone is useless. Battery kind of made me think of love, right? Okay, let me tell you what I mean. You can do a lot of things in your life. You can do anything in your life. You can be a pastor, you can be a missionary, you can be a doctor, but you know what? If you don't have love, then God cannot use it. All right? So, if you're a preacher, but you don't have love, you don't do it for love, then God cannot use it. But if you do it in love, if you teach Sunday school, if you help in the nursery, if you help in children's church, I know a lot of y'all older ones help in children's church, you do it in love, then God can use it. Does that make sense? Because he is love. So it's very important that whatever we do in life, I think y'all learned this at camp, whatever you eat, drink, whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, that's right. You do it all for him in love, okay? Or otherwise, it's just like a dead battery. God can't use your phone or, so to speak. My verse wasn't 1 Corinthians 10, 31. It was 1 Corinthians 13, 2. It says, and if I have prophetic powers, you know, a nice big word, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. So it's very important that you do everything for his glory for love. Okay? Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for what we can learn from simple household items. Um, I thank you for your spirit who is able to help teach us to do things in love. And I pray for these kids. I pray for Vacation Bible School tonight. You need my prayer. Amen. Good job, guys. Y'all like snakes. Thank you, Nicole, for picking up my slack. Um, I'm so thankful to be back. I want to start off first. I'm going to have Mike and Donna come up here in a second, but I want to start off first by saying thank you to everybody that called, text, messaged, um, prayed for me as I was uh, sickest I've ever been in 44 years, which made me an even bigger baby because I didn't know how to act. Um, I didn't know what it was like to lay in bed all day. Um, can't when you get up. I mean, I was being, I was worn out brushing my teeth. Like I've never had that. So anyway. God has blessed me to let me go 44 years without this, and then I got COVID, which it was humbling because I would brag and tell people I'm, I'm immune because I was around people, and people talked to me, and I may even have to drink after people that had it, my wife, and we didn't know, um, and I never got sick. And so, uh, But thank you to everybody. Thank you, Tommy, for filling in last minute. Um, I know it's not easy, 
Uh, Mike, thank you for filling in. Um, Charlie, thank you. You, you took the brunt of the uh, business meeting as well as uh, one of the Sunday nights or Wednesday night? Wednesday night, I believe. You had a Wednesday night also. So I've been gone for a little bit. But uh, I just want to say thank you to everybody. Uh, I really appreciate it. My family appreciated it. And uh, way to be awesome. So at this time. She keeps up, we keep up with, uh, y'all remember Zuyu and Adina that came to our church? We've uh, supported them in lots of different ways. The house of joy was one of the big ways that we supported them. And we bought them, uh, or helped buy, bought a van for them, and so vehicles and, and so forth. They, they are in Romania, which is bordering uh, Ukraine. Romania has the, the biggest border uh, to Ukraine than anybody does. So they're taking in a lot of people. And I was thinking yesterday, me and Mama, we, we have date nights on Friday nights, every Friday night. <laughs> and they're good date nights. Anyway, with that said, we was, uh, we was talking about uh, <coughs> supporting them, you know, giving them a little bit of money that we got. And we were just wanting to, to give you an invitation to help support them because they have taken in like 162 people so far from Russia, you know, Ukraine, getting out of Russia. Uh, a lot of that has been uh, uh, the people were hurt, you know, so they were actually able to help them medically. As, and, and those people lost their, uh, their some of their family, they've lost their homes, they've lost their jobs, and um, you know they they've lost their their way of life and lost their way. And Vidu, Dina, they're good Christian people. We know that they preached right here at this you know this podium, and um, so giving back to them in a Christian way is something we can do for those people in Ukraine. This is a way we can actually help that effort. So anyway, we uh, we looked at a, a video sent, sent on a text message thing there, stuff, whatever, how they do that thing nowadays. And she's going to read that to you real quick. Like. He, he may send different ones, these messages. Um, we fortunately do um, get a message from a video in Adina. And it kind of just updates things with the House of Joy. But we all know about the war that's going on and um, thought this might be helpful to understand just a little bit better. Actually, the House of Joy that we have had a part of, that God blessed us with the opportunity to have a part of, to um, share his word and um, take care of these folks. So here we go. It's kind of long. Dear Donna, the work with the 40 Ukrainian war refugees continues here at the House of Joy, Romania. Yesterday in the meeting that we had with some of the refugees, some of the Ukrainian ladies were crying, being grateful to God for the hospitality they found in Romania. Each Sunday they are in church with us. Over the week they have a couple of Bible study meetings with a large group of them. Many of the 250 Ukrainian refugees that were sheltered in the House of Joy, Romania in the last three months received transportation assistance and medical assistance. I do believe many of them were deeply impacted by Christ staying here with us a day, a week, a month, or two months, however long. With the Russian invasion or when the Russian invasion took place on February 24th, 2022, I thought it would be a quick military event. But now we look back at the three months in which we were directly involved in sheltering the Ukrainian war refugees and we never dreamed in the beginning of the year 
that the house of joy would be used by God in this way. One thing is sure in life, expect the unexpected. In God's program are many unexpected things as we walk with him. We have also learned to trust in his power and resources for all the unexpected situations he is, talking, he is taking us in. We are really ready to move to the next level and be prepared mentally, spiritually, logistically to have the Ukrainian refugees for a whole year in the House of George Hussani, Romania. We step in faith again that the war will end soon, but we also step in faith trusting God for the strength and the necessary resources to house the people of Ukraine here with us. Let's continue to pray and to create awareness around this critical and historical need that is ahead of us in the coming months. Let's take each day and each month at a time and see how things will evolve as we make and develop together this humanitarian effort. Together with God, we are stronger than the war. And that is the end of this update. Um, Please be mindful and keep them in prayer as they are really hands-on with helping um, the refugees. So bottom line is next Sunday, we was, I asked uh, Charlie and uh, uh, Ryan whether it would be okay if we was to ask you all if you wanted to, to give a couple of dollars uh, as a love offering. We're going to do it, so just asking if you all wanted to, to, to get it to one of them fellows or somebody and we'll... We'll get it through Bob Craven, uh, who gets it. Uh, 100% of that money goes straight to a video and a dean. You know, it goes straight House to of them, joy. House of Joy. So just wanted you all to know that, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Mike and Donna. And even if you can't give monetarily, please remember uh, them in your prayers. And um, that's a personal connection this church has with what's going on in Ukraine. Um, and I've got other pastor friends who know of missionaries that are in Ukraine or Romanian outside of the, that country, uh, and it's the same thing. So just pray for them, uh, pray that God continues to move, and that uh, the war does end soon, and it ends in a way that Russia doesn't win. So I said it. All right, so we got a few announcements. Uh, before we get started with the announcements, I, we have a card. Um, and so I'm going to read the card to the, uh, read the card now. Just wanted you to know what a blessing you are to us, to our loving church family. We thank God for the countless ways your friendship has refreshed our spirit and renewed a song in our heart. Thank you for all the love, calls, texts, and prayer during our time of medical issues. It is such a blessing to be a part of such a loving church. May God continue to bless each one of you and our church. We love you all, Joel and Teresa. And I miss this part of sweet friendship, refreshes the soul, Proverbs 27, 9. So thank you so much for the card. And uh, now you made my thanks look like nothing. So, uh, But uh, Joel and Teresa are very thankful. and We love you guys and uh, glad to see you still moving around. And Joel not buried somewhere. Glad you all are here. So uh, Vacation Bible School starts tonight. I'm excited. Um, I'm hoping we get some uh, get some kids to come out here and enjoy uh, Mother Mary, because I heard she's taken out all ages. Um, oh, you didn't know that? Sorry, we just we talked about it last night, made the decision. Um, but uh, Vacation Bible School starts tonight at 6, and it'll go to Thursday, the 21st, and it goes from 6 to 8.30. Now, here's what I do know. What I do know is they will start in the fellowship hall eating. They're gonna, everybody's going to eat at once. Then they're going to come in here, and we're going to do devotional time and some other stuff, and uh, that'll be about 10, 15 minutes, 10, 12 minutes, and then we will go from there. Then the schedule all kind of scatters out to whatever age group you have. Um, so I'm looking forward to tonight. So we, some of us will be staying after church today to decorate. And so if you would like to, uh, please let Nicole know because we're going to be ordering pizza. So you'll be staying and eating here. Um, we got quite a few folks that are staying, so don't feel like you have to. Uh, that's why a text wasn't sent out or a robocall wasn't sent out. Um, but I want to offer it to anybody that doesn't have anything going on today that would like to stay and help out, you get some free pizza. So, uh, and then Children's Day Out, the last day for Children's Day Out will be Tuesday, July 26th. 
uh, a huge thank you, a huge shout out to Megan and Maggie for making that happen. Um, I know when my kids were there, um, they had a blast. They'll be there the last uh, Tuesday as well. Uh, but thank you so much, Megan and Maggie, for putting that on. And I hope we can continue doing that in the future. And uh, I won't get sick and my kids can make it every Tuesday. So, um, and then we have upcoming July 31st is communion. And I'll look at some of the supplies. I was asked about that this morning. Teachers, I was going to call each and every one of you up here again this morning to give you your gift and your check, uh, your love offering, but I'm not going to do that. So if I haven't seen you this morning, please come see me after service, and I've got the stuff in my office. Um, and what we got them, church, was a little prayer journal with their name and a Bible verse on it, as well as a pen with their name and a, a specific Bible verse for each individual. So um, thank you all so much for giving uh, those gifts. Sorry. Tommy, I didn't uh, get to the olive tree to get them so you could hand them out. So uh, my apologies. I watched and I was like, man, poor Tommy. He's standing up there telling him thank you. And then, all right, go sit down. But uh, Tommy, my bad for, for leaving you hanging. Uh, but if you talk to Paul, that's what I'm good at. So, um, but uh, any other announcements that I'm missing? Any other announcements? Donna, do we remember how much we gave, or the how much the checks were for the teachers? I'd forgotten. I don't have my notes on here. Okay. Yeah. So thank you to everybody that gave. Oh yeah. Okay. So yeah, twenty. Right, because of EVS. So the last. So it's next Tuesday, not this Tuesday. Thank you, Donna. Thank you. Yep. The twenty sixth. All right. I think. So, we have birthdays. Uh, today's the 17th, right? All right. So, we had Tammy Floyd on Monday. Uh, I hope everybody gave Teresa a lot of love last Sunday, as it was her birthday. Joel, what'd you do for her? And then you're... It was nice and quiet Sunday? Nice. Nice. I'm going to quit asking. All right. Um, I do marital counseling, uh, free of charge for members, certified. Anyway, um, but happy birthday, Teresa. Hey, I didn't even get to you till the next day myself. So, um, Joel, you weren't alone. The only difference is I don't have to live in the same house as her. So, uh, but uh, then we have uh, Stevie Button on uh, the 16th, which was yesterday, and then we don't have anything upcoming. We do have Jennifer Beasley and Mandy McLaughlin next week, but we'll get to them. And then Richard, you're turning, what, 26 this month? You don't look a day over 25, I'll tell you. Must be something in the water. But uh, if you see those folks, please wish them a happy, happy birthday. And so on that note, prayer. Do we need to add anybody to our prayer roster? I did. Joel? Joel, yeah. Joel, what in Teresa, the patience. Fair enough. Remember VBS tonight. Um, remember those that are sick, those that are traveling, those that are on vacation. Uh, we have a lot of those. Uh, we got some praises. Um, I was talking to William last night. He texted a check on me, and then he said, I just wanted to make sure that I was getting your Jeep if you were dying. So I told him, I'll take care of that. It'll be in the will form. So um, just everybody knows the Jeep's spoken for if anything happens to me. Um, but, uh, no, he was checking on me, but, you know, he had a rough go of it. And he had this rash, he said, that felt like he was laying on a uh, red ant pile for nine days. And they couldn't figure out what it was. Uh, I think he took him to the emergency room twice during this period. And uh, all they could say was it's COVID-related. So, um, but he's thankful that he's not feeling that way anymore, and he's feeling a lot better. So, and then the family, obviously, is feeling a lot better. So, uh, that's a huge praise. Any other prayer requests besides our normal roster? All right. McLaughlin family. Yes, ma'am, you sure will. Any others? All right. So this time... 
is the time of our deacon prayer. The altar's open. Feel free to come forward and pray if you'd like, or you can pray right where you're at. Uh, Richard, I'd like to ask you to come forward, one of our deacons, to pray during this time. God, so Lord, we just want to come before you, thanking you for this day, Lord, and that each one is here, Lord, coming to worship you. And those not able to be here, I pray you just be with them in a special way. Would you be with Ryan today as he brings the message, Lord? Be with those that are involved in the Bible school, Lord, that they will be able to uh, accomplish it on, and all the kids even talk. Just thank you for this day, Lord, all you have done for us throughout the day. Just each one of you request today, Lord, that you would. Uh, that we have each individual God, just praise you and thank you, oh God. Use us in the ways be pleasing to you. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Our offertory hymn is three hundred and sixty-three. Let others see Jesus in you. If you will stand and sing with me, please. Thank you. 
Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, Melba. Good job, John David. You want to be the prayer guy up here? You can pray every time we got to pray. You did a good job. You, you, you let other people do it? Hey, that's good, good for you. Good for you. I'll tell you, that man is professional. I don't care what anybody says. Well, good morning again, church. It's such a... I'll tell you, I'm excited. I may not look like it. I may look like a bum you just picked up off the street because I do need a haircut. My beard needs to be trimmed. I get all that. Um, I just ain't got to it. It may be another couple weeks till I do. I'm looking forward to how I'm going to look. I'm just telling you. I might do a man bun. David ain't here to tell me he'll throw me out of the church. So I might do a man bun. Who knows where this is going? But it's going to be sexy regardless. I just want to make sure everybody knows that. So um, this, <laughs> thank you, Nicole. Um, so this morning, we're going to be in the uh, book of 2 Timothy, uh, the New Testament, chapter 3. And Last week, as you all know, was Teacher Appreciation Sunday, and this was in preparation. I sent this to Donna and the rest of the folks, said, this is what I'm going to preach on. And uh, so when I was uh, found out I was still sick and uh, wasn't going to be here to preach, and Tommy was going to do it, I started praying and asking God if there was something else he wanted me to uh, uh, preach on this morning, and it, it, this just felt right. Um, as we're getting ready to go into the new school year, we know how important teaching is. We know how important truth is. And a lot of times, especially in today's society, you don't get a lot of teaching and truth together. You just get a lot of teaching, and then the truth's over here somewhere. Because this teaching that you're getting is just their truth, or their version, or whatever you want to say. So this morning, we're going to focus on what the Scripture teaches us. Because in Timothy, the, the two letters that Paul sent to Timothy, the first letter, uh, as well as maybe even the first there is the first couple chapters and two, Paul was letting Timothy know what he was getting ready to deal with. Paul was letting Timothy know, hey, this is the state of the world that you are in. And understand during his time, who was big? What religion was big? Gnosticism. Remember, it was all the smart people. And they were only smart because God showed them favor and they only had the word of God. And you had to listen to them. Everybody remembers the Gnostics, Gnosticism? Well, that's the world that Timothy was in. And so Paul's preparing him in his letter. Paul's helping him as he says, hey, this is what you're dealing with. You're dealing with a bunch of heresy. You're dealing with a bunch of false gospels. You're dealing with a bunch of false religions, false prophets. But see, this is what I like about Paul is after he tells, told Timothy, hey, this is what you're in, he tells Timothy how to deal with it. He says, now what do we do? Now what do you do? And understand, when Paul wrote these, he also said the end of times. See, we've been in the end of times since Acts chapter 1. As soon as Jesus ascended to heaven, the end of times started. Because now we are just waiting, much like Paul and Timothy, for the second coming of Christ. So we find ourselves picking this up in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. And the focus this morning is going to be on the scripture. The focus this morning is going to be on the scripture. And so there's a few little things I'd like to share. Paul's letter to Timothy, again, was a reminder of the time Timothy was serving in. It wasn't sugar-coated. It was, hey, this is what you got. This is what you got to deal with. Then he told him, again, what to expect. And then we see Paul pivot to how to act. What Timothy was supposed to do. 
Ultimately, Paul wanted to keep Timothy grounded in truth, and we know where that truth comes from. There's only one. It's Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by through me, whatever your translation says. But Paul wanted to keep Timothy grounded in the truth. And I will tell you, this is so relevant today because we need truth today. This world needs truth today. Our kids need truth today. And I'm going to tell you this morning that sometimes truth hurts feelings. But it means we still, it doesn't mean we don't speak truth. It doesn't mean we don't stand up and speak for truth. We don't stand up and speak for God. We cannot be afraid of what the enemy is going to do to us. We have to be grounded in truth. But see, in like Timothy, we can find truth in God's word. We can find truth in God's word, which we know is the scripture, which we know Jesus Christ was word in the flesh. In the beginning was the word, John 1, 1. I I mean, there's so much that can go into this. I'm going to try not to go too long this morning, but just know if I do, you're welcome. Uh, But Timothy faced the lies of Satan as he went through his ministry, much like the other um, apostles during his time, the other preachers during his time. Paul encouraged through these letters Timothy to remember what he was taught. Which, if you look at the translation, what he was taught was the sacred letters. Now, the sacred letters are the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. See, Timothy, um, the Jewish tradition of that time was that all males would begin to be taught the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, as I said, at the age of five. It's also known as the Pentateuch. And so, how he did this was he did this through writing out his alphabets, by writing out the Old Testament, the first five books of the Bible. And so the bottom line of this message this morning, the bottom line, I'm going to give it to you up front so you can go to sleep if you want after this. We are to continue in God's word. That's it. We are to continue in God's word. But what does this mean, right? So let's pick it up in 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Let's pray. Father, we humbly come to you this morning as we dive into your word. God, I just pray that the Holy Spirit permeates this place, God, and that whatever you want each and every person to get out of this message this morning, that they get it. God, that it's so loud that there can be no, uh, or so in their face, there can be no confusion as to what you want them to know, what you want us to know, what you want us to learn, how you want us to act. So God, be with us as we, as we dive into your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so, you know, what does this mean? Right. So the first thing that we see in verse 15, the first part of 15 is he calls they are holy. Now we know what holy means, right? And how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings. They were holy. Uh, as I said, Timothy learned the Hebrew alphabet by spelling his way through the Torah, or what they called the sacred letters of their time. And now here's something that's interesting. He was taught by his grandmother and mother. He was taught by his grandmother and mother. See, it wasn't that just Timothy happened to come upon these sacred writings and happen at five years old to want to teach himself how to write. I don't know about you, but I have yet to have a kid, and I've had four of them in my house. I haven't personally had them. My wife has. I want to make sure I make that clear, ladies. But I've had four kids in my household that none of them like writing, especially once they start school. Now, they like writing on the walls. They like writing on doors. You know, they like all that other stuff. But once you have to sit them down and tell them, hey, you're going to learn how to do this, they don't want to do it. So we know that Timothy didn't learn this on his own. He had to have somebody that taught him. He had to have somebody that instilled in him the importance of this practice. He did not do it on his own. It was his mother and grandmother. Now, the, the, the word holy means consecrated for sacred use. See, we know that the Bible is different than any other book. We can agree on that, correct? I mean, if you're a believer this morning, the Bible is different than any other book. And we're going to get into why a little bit later. But the Bible is different. 
See, what we have in our hands is the inspired word of God. Now, I want to make sure that we... I want to make sure that we don't take that word inspired and think about, like, Wearsby used an example when I was reading through his uh, commentary, you know, like, Shakespeare was inspired. That's not the inspiration we're talking about here. We're talking about a supernatural inspiration. We're talking about a sovereign God that saw each and every person that inspired each and every man who wrote in the Bible or who wrote the Bible. See, Timothy was not only taught through education, but by the example his grandmother, mother, and Paul had set for him. See, learning is important. I think we can all agree on that, right? You know, there's a huge movement in the Southern Baptist world right now that if you don't have a doctorate, you're not going to get a big church. And I'll tell you, I've known some people that are so smart, they're stupid. To me... I learn more from common sense people. I learn more from people that have been there and done that than I do from people that have just sat in a chair and learned from a uh, slideshow. I don't know about you. So there's more to learning than just sitting in the classroom. There's examples that have to be set. See, we can sit and we can say all day long, kids need to be in church. How do they know they're supposed to be in church? Are we in church? Are we talking to them about the importance of church? See, it's an example that we have to set. It's not just that we walk into the church, right? We have to grab them and say, let's go. You're going to come. I want you to learn. I want you to see what it is about this man they call Jesus, what he can do for your life, how you have a father that will never let you down because we have so many kids, we have so many adults who have their family members that have let them down, their fathers who were just not either there or were worthless as fathers. They didn't, weren't raised biblical. But they need to know they have a heavenly father who is perfect, who will never leave them, who will never forsake them, who in their most trying times he is closest while everybody else may be turning their back on him. So Timothy not only was taught through education, but he was taught through the example of his uh, family and the example of Paul. See, the scripture, if you continue on to reading 15b, they lead to salvation. Make sure you understand I said lead. Not believing in the Bible makes you saved. That's not what Paul is saying. That's not what Paul is saying. 15b, the end of 15 says, which you are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. See, how we know that Paul's not saying that believing, just simply believing that this is real makes you saved, right? We understand this is the inspired word of God, but simply knowing that, the devil knows it, and they shudder. Simply knowing that does not mean that we are saved. Jesus, the, the, the man, the, the, the word in the flesh that walked the earth had disciples that left him after they spent time with him. They got to see it in real life. They were not saved. They were not saved. So you can believe that Jesus, or you can believe that the Bible is inspired word of God, but it doesn't mean you are saved. So how we know that is John 5, 39. It says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is that they bear witness about Jesus, about me. See, what the Bible is, it's a tool. It's a tool. And it's a multi, uh, what do they call it, multi-tool? Uh, Gerber, right? I could take this and I can sit down with somebody and I can show them uh, things that are in the Bible that talk about maybe what they're going through. Maybe gives them a little bit of peace about what they're going through. Or I, I can sit down and, and say, hey, this thing that you're doing is not right, and here's why. And, and as a leader in the church, you can't be doing X, Y, and Z, and here's why. But the Bible is a multi-tool. Then you got Satan and his enemies attacked. Then it becomes a weapon, <laughs> also called a sword. I'm sorry, I get excited about weapons. But it's also called a sword, right? We read about that in Ephesians. But this is a multi-tool, and what the Bible, believing it is very important, but it does not lead, it does not make one saved. It just teaches you about who to go to. It teaches about why we have the opportunity to be saved. It teaches you about the death, burial, and resurrection. It gives us examples of how to live. It gives, us, it gives us examples of how not to live. It gives us examples of when we make this mistake, how we ask for forgiveness and how we move on. This, this word teaches us that we're never too lost for God. 
See, our salvation comes from strictly trusting Christ and believing that he died on the cross, was buried for three days, and I want to make sure we put the word dead in there because that is important to our salvation. He was dead, but then he rose again, praise God. Now he sits at the right hand of the Father. That's how we become saved. We believe that. And then there's a little addition to that. We have to remember that we're sinners who are in need of a Savior. Again, it's one thing to know that there's a God. It's another thing to believe and trust in him. So another, um, yeah, we're, we're sinners in need of a Savior. Uh, now this need doesn't end. Here's the other thing that, that I believe myself uh, can fall into, especially you've been going to church for a long time. You, you know, you get all these educational classes that tell you all these smart things and you just start thinking you're smart. You know, needing of a Savior um, doesn't end once you become saved. The need for a Savior does not end once you become saved. The need for a Savior does not end because you go to church. The end uh, of the need for a sa- or the need for a savior does not end because you know X, Y, and Z through the Bible. Everyone needs the savior because remember, in the Bible, we're going to be saved, we are saved, and are uh, yeah, and then we're going to be saved, past, present, and future. Teachers, forgive me, uh, but there's three participles, right? Sweet, I got that one right. I did listen. I did learn a little bit in school, but um. Everyone needs to be saved. It does not matter if one is a baby. What needs a savior is a baby Christian or has a lot of years in a pew, teaching or preaching. We all need Jesus the same. Now, it does not mean our relationship with Jesus is the same. I want to understand that or our walk with Jesus is the same. But each and every person needs Jesus the same. Because, let me ask you. If you come up here and let's say you kneel at the, at the altar and you ask God to forgive you, and you believe that he is Lord, and you believe he died for your sins, and you go through all that, and then you get up, and then you think, I'm good. What happens? I doubt you're saved. That's what the scripture tells us. I doubt that you're saved. Because if if you read the scripture, there's so much more to being a Christian than just accepting the atonement. The blood of Jesus Christ that covers our sins, that makes us able to have a relationship with God the Father. There's so much more to it than that. See, Paul was brought, or uh, Timothy was brought up in a godly home. But here's the here's the interesting thing, and the thing that I enjoy is that Paul is the one that God used to bring Timothy to Christ. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? The man was brought up with the sacred letters. The man was brought up in a godly home, but God used Paul to bring Timothy to the Lord. He used Timothy to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Or he used Paul to bring uh, Timothy to God to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. See, and here's what the Bible teaches us about salvation. Here's what the Bible, and I'm going to make this uh, as short as I can. The Bible, first off, shows us a need shows us our need, or shows us a need for salvation. It shows us that we need. Perfect. The garden was perfect. There was no sin. There was no knowledge of good and evil. And then Adam and Eve, Satan, And we know the rest is history because we live in it. We're born in it. But the Bible points out our filthiness. The Bible points out our sinfulness. The Bible points out our inability to have a relationship with God apart from Jesus Christ and what he did on that cross. I think I got these right today. The Bible tells us about condemnation through living a life without God, what that looks like. I'm not going to read it, but John 3, 18 through 21, you can find that. And the necessity for a Savior now. See, that's where a lot of times I believe that as evangelicals, as Christians, we kind of start losing people. Because then it seems like a pressure cell. We know that people do not want to. If the Holy Spirit is moving them and they're not saved, we know that people do not want to get up and walk away from that. We know that it's important that if you are convicted of your sins is to get saved then and there, not walk out. But here's what happens, right? And I know you all have heard this. 
If you don't get saved now, I've known people that walk out that door and get hit by a car and die immediately, and they go to hell. That's probably not the right way to share that, because that's not what God wants. God wants them to come to salvation, but only God can move them through the Holy Spirit. We're just the the tools that he uses to provide them with the truth, the scripture, the gospel, the Bible. See, but the Bible, and here's the beauty of the Bible. The Bible reveals to us God's amazing plan of salvation, how Christ died. How if we trust him, he will save us. And that's John 3, 16 through 18. You can look that up. See, the Bible also gives us assurance of our salvation. And this, I think, is important that we read this in 1 John 5, 9 through 13. And John wrote, if we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he is born concerning his son. Whoever believes in the son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has born concerning his son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. Now, to go a little bit further How do we know who Christians are? What does Paul tell us? Through the fruit of the Spirit. You know you are my people through the fruit of the Spirit. They know, they know, they know. So if you're expressing fruit of the Spirit, then you believe in the Son and you have life. See, the Bible is our spiritual food. Prayer is very important. It should be the foundation of everything that we do. But, you know, a lot of times when I'm talking to people here, I just wish God would speak to me. Well, then my first question is, when was the last time you read the Bible? Because God speaks to us through his word as well. And I want to I want to caveat this because this is one area I struggle. I was with a bunch of pastors and we were kind of talking about our devotional time, reading time. And, you know, I've heard the pastors get up and say, I get up at four in the morning, and for three hours I'm reading the Bible, praying, and meditating on God's word. That's good. There's nothing wrong with that. But it shouldn't make someone like me, and maybe some of you out there like me, that have the attention span of a gnat, feel bad for not being able to sit for three hours and read and pray. Now, I'm not saying it's not possible. What I'm saying is I can do it, but throughout the process, I'm probably going to think about what I need to pick up from the grocery store, what to-do list Felicia's got me on. My brain goes every which way. That's just the way I am wired. And so one of the things that the the, the pastor, um, who's way smarter than me, brought up, um, which is not hard, but he does, he's a doctor. He is real, he's smarter than me, and I respect him a lot. One of the things he said is he said, I don't think it's about the qual- quantity of time, or maybe the quantity of scripture, because I don't know if you remember whole four chapters a day in the Bible, right? Uh, Read your Bible through in a year, which is not a bad thing, but if if you're simply focused on just making sure you read that Bible in through in a year, are you really grasping what those chapters tell you? Are you really grasping what the scripture's saying? Now, if you can do it and grasp that, all power to you. I cannot, because all I can think of is I've got to finish this in a year, because it's a competition. I can't help it. I don't know why. That's just how I think. What he said was it's the quality. He said maybe it's just God wants you to read one verse and then meditate on that. Think about that one verse. There's devotionals, and I know a lot of y'all use those. Those are amazing. Um, But what I'm getting at is there's no right way for everybody. There's no cookie-cutter way for everybody to to, uh, spend time in his word and what that looks like. God created us all differently. But it is important that we spend time in his word because it is our spiritual fruit, or our spiritual food. Now, finally, as Paul points out in Ephesians, it is our weapon. I got a little excited earlier, if you remember. It is a Christian's best defense against the enemy and their attacks. There's no other. And I'll go even further to say, um, you know, if you know the scripture, if you know the word, if you know doctrine, if you understand what, God, what Jesus is uh, saying, if what God is saying, what the, the, the inspired men that wrote the Bible um, wrote about, if you understand that, you can stand up to heresy, stand up to lies, you can stand up to sin, and you can do it in a way 
then is God honoring? There was a quote I read, and I was looking it up this morning, and I've got one later on, but it's by Habner, um, Vance Habner, and I don't know if you heard him, but he was a theologian uh, years ago. And uh, the quote, I'm going to butcher it, but the gist of the quote was, Satan's attack on the church, his greatest attack on the church, is the false gospels and making the church soft. So then people know that what's being fed to them from the pulpit or what's being fed to them from their favorite preacher on TV or from YouTube or whatever is wrong, but guess what? They're too scared to stand up and say anything about it. And the sad thing is there's churches in Sumter I know this about. There's churches in Sumter that are dealing with this right now. Influential churches because no, everybody's afraid to stand up and say, this is wrong what's being taught. This is wrong with what's being said. So, as we continue, the word of God is true and dependable. Verse 16, at the beginning, says, all scriptures breathed out by God. So, again, here's what I want us to get. Truth, truth, truth. That's what matters this morning. That's what matters every day. That's what should matter to each and every one of us. Truth. Because that's what the scripture is, is breathed out by God. See, if you're a believer this morning, it is illogical for us to think that a sovereign God would provide us with anything other than something we could trust. Why would he? And I'm not going to get into the different um, variations of translations. That's not what I'm talking about. Now, I used to be the KJV only crowd, and I was pretty ugly about it. And I preach out of an ESV now. But here's what I'm going to tell you, and I heard this from a pastor multiple times as people would ask him, hey, what's the best translation of the Bible? The one that you'll pick up and read. Think of how simple that is. If the KJV is for you, use it. I love the KJV. I use it in my study time. I use it in my personal reading time. I love the KJV. It's a very good translation. But so are some of the others. So are some of the others. And so if somebody's going to pick up the Bible and read truth, it doesn't matter the translation. Now, there are some bad translations. I'm just not going to get into that this morning, but understand what I'm saying. Let them pick it up and let them read it. And then as they grow, maybe they'll see stuff that's wrong with it. But God can use anything. God uses the truth, and the truth is in his word. The authentic- Now, here's, a, here's a, another thing is the authenticity of the Bible has been attacked since the beginning of time. You know who the first one was to attack the Bible and the scripture? Satan. Genesis 3.1. Hath God said? Hath God not said? Remember, as he's trying to flip it around, get Eve to sin. So the, the, the authenticity of the scripture ha- has been attacked since the beginning of time. Satan was the first one to attack it. But see, here's what we know. We know that the Holy Spirit of God, and this is Warren Wearsby's quote, used men of God to write the word of God. The Holy Spirit, I'm going to repeat that for those that are slow like me. The Holy Spirit of God used men of God to write the word of God. In 2 Peter 1, 20-21, this is what we say. So if we're going to talk about the scripture and the truth of scripture, I think it's important that we go back to the scripture to talk about what we're talking about, right? Well, 2 Peter 1, 20-21 tells us, Knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that. See, God brought about the miracle in the Scriptures. It doesn't matter where you read, whether it's the Old Testament, which atheists love to bring up the Old Testament in their defense that there is no God, or their defense that God is not loving, or in their defense that, you know, whatever they're, they're arguing with a Christian about, an agnostic or atheist or, you know, Satanist, whoever um, you want to put into that spot. But see, God brought about the miracle of the Scripture. This is a miracle. This is the oldest book. Do you know this is the most read book? The highest selling book? You wouldn't know it by the state of the affairs of our world today, right? But it is. There's nothing literary, nothing else literary. This is how supernatural this is that has lasted or stood the test of time like the Bible has. What we're preaching and teaching today was taught back in the old times when the first folks that were still um, 
uh, Polycarp. He knew John the Baptist, or he, John the Baptist. He knew John personally, the John of Revelations. Like we're still preaching and teaching the same stuff. There's nothing that has lasted as long as this Bible. Tell me why people would be willing to die for something that wasn't true. And I'm going to leave it at that. Why would people be willing to die for something that was not true? See, the inspiration, again, is a supernatural one. The Bible is a true record of events in the lives of men, women, and children that God used for his glory and for our salvation. Remember, everything in the Bible points to Jesus Christ, starting with Genesis 1-1. Everything in the Bible points to the need of a Savior and his saving grace. Whether it's through the cross or revelation, when he saves us at the second coming and we get our glorified bodies. They are profitable. Scriptures are profitable. 16b, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Now, let, let's dig into this a little bit. What are the scriptures profitable for? Doctrine. Doctrine simply means what is right. What is right? There's a lot of doctrine out there that's not right. And if you get into God's word, you can figure that out. You can see what's important. There's a lot of gospels out there that they put things in front of, like social gospel. Uh, anyway, there's so many gospels out there. I'm not going to go down the list. I'm trying to get this done because I know some of you want to go eat. But there's so many different gospels out there. There's only one gospel. There's only one Jesus Christ. And he died for all man's sin. That's it. We can't add all that other stuff to it. Because it's already encompassed in God's saving work on this earth. There's only one gospel. The truth. And see, that's the only way that this world is going to figure out how to fix themselves, how to fix it, how, how to make it better, how to be better. Is if more truth is out there. As opposed to the lies that we keep hearing. But, um... I'm going to get off that soapbox. So what is Scripture brought for? Doctrine. What is right? Reproof. What is not right? Sin is sin. I don't know how to say this and say that anything is not a sin that is specifically said in this inspired word of God can say it's not a sin. How can they do that? They don't believe that this is the infallible inspired word of God. Period. Dot. Right? But it tells us what is not right. Then it gives us correction, how to get right. That's what the scripture does for us. How to get right. How to live in that truth. How to separate yourself from the untruth and live in truth. And this living in truth is day to day. Then instructions in righteousness. This one I love, how to stay right. How to stay in truth. How to stay out of trouble. How to stay out of sin. Maybe something that has bonded you for years. The Bible tells you how to deal with that, and it helps you with dealing with that. See, we're to study our Bibles and live out what is taught, become profitable men and women of God. Now, understand this profit is not something that you could put in the bank. This profit is not anything you could tangibly hold in your hands right now, right? But what you can do is you can take it to the bank that you will get to withdraw this when, we, when you get to heaven, when we get to heaven. You're going to see this profit if you're living this life, the crowns and the jewels, it's truth. The word of God equips us for his service. Verse 17, the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So how does that happen? And then ultimately, here's the tough one, even for me, giving up control of our lives and living it out. See, all the men of the Bible, like Timothy, that were called men of God, which we had Moses, Samuel, Elijah, Elisha, and David, to name a few, were all devoted to God's word. They were all devoted to God's word. Why? Because it's truth. The people in the Bible that were labeled men of God were all devoted to the word of God.
Now, I want us to focus real quick on two words in that verse. Perfect. Perfect could mean complete, put into shape, in fit condition. Now, what this means is like Timothy, we are fitted for use. When we read the Bible, when we live in God's truth, we are fitted for use. We are not perfect. Understand that that word does not mean that we are perfect. We're only fitted for use because of whose we are, because we believe in the resurrected Son of God. And then furnished. We are equipped for service. Furnished means equipped for service. The Bible furnishes and equips a believer to live a life pleasing to God and to do the work God wanted us or wants us to do. That's what the Bible does. It equips us. It gets us ready. It molds us and it fits us into what God wants us to be. Think about it. Because it's so easy when we watch TV. It's so easy when we get on that internet to form to what the world wants us to be or to think. Well, I don't have as much money as that person. I'm not as attractive as that pastor over at First Baptist Church of Turboville. Y'all are welcome. But you see what I'm saying? It's so easy to get wrapped up in, in fitting into the mold of what society tells us or this world tells us we're supposed to be. And that's not, as Christ follows, that's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to allow the scripture to fit us and mold us for his use. The ultimate purpose of the scripture is to equip believers. That's it. The ultimate purpose of the scriptures is to equip us. Truth matters. Truth is very important. And then equipped um, will be used to prepare our uh, we will be used if we are equipped. We'll, we we will be used or prepared to be used. We as we said, it is the word of God that equips God's people to do the work of God. You notice I like Wearsby. I like him a lot. You haven't heard of him? Look him up. He's good. So then it all comes down to what, right? It all comes down to what. I know today I've mingled in the the the, the scripture with kind of how it applies to us today, but this all boils down to attitude. What is our attitude towards God? What is our attitude towards being a Christian? What is our attitude? Because actions reflect our attitude. I'm just going to tell you that now. I'm sure you all have heard that. Actions reflect our attitude. Do we truly care about the community? Do we truly care about the kids? Do we truly care about our schools? Do we truly care about our teachers? Do we truly care about our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ? Do we truly care about the truth? Or is it all about our truth? Because there's only one truth. There's only one truth. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 says, And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. See, so our attitude should be we should be all about wanting to teach the next generation the word of God, what it means. And I'll, I just want to give you a little secret. It's probably not going to look like it did when you were kids. At the end of the day, it's probably not going to look like it did when you guys were kids. There's a day coming that I believe that buildings like this will no longer exist. Buildings like this will no longer exist. Because why should it? Why should young people come to this church? Why should young people, or why should people in general, give to the offering? What do we do for the community? What do we do for the least of these? Very, we're very giving church. But I do think it's something that, that not just this church, but every church is going to have to face in the future, is what does worship look like? Does it look like three hymns and a, and a message and a few prayers? Does it look like a piano and an organ? What does worship look like? I mean, David worshiped with a harp. What does worship look like? We are to teach the children the Bible, much like Timothy's mother and grandmother. We need to surround our kids with the Bible. Surround them with the word of God. This could look like individual family devotion times. I struggle with this. because My kids get on my nerves. The last thing I want to do is sit at a table with them and try and explain stuff to them as they're talking back to me. Because they're smart smarter than her dad. 
but it can look like family devotion and corporate worship, coming to church, spending time together, Awana, like we're starting tonight, VBS, camps. That is how we can surround our children. We can surround people. And I'm going to tell you something, adults. You go as a sponsor to camp with some of these kids, you're going to learn something too. I promise you that. So understand I'm talking about kids because the message is supposed to be on teacher appreciation and all of our teachers teach kids. But understand this is for adults too. You're not done learning. If you're sitting here breathing this morning, you're not done learning. And if you think you are, you're dead. Green and growing are ripe and rotten. I had a boss that used to tell me that all the time. But we are to teach. We are to surround our kids. Be the example when interacting with others, when interacting with children. Show them the importance of the gospel and living a life grounded in truth. They don't know what truth is today. Truth to them is social media. Truth to them is whatever influencer is on Twitter that they follow or hashtag whatever or what's another, Instagram. I mean, they got all these uh, Snapchats, another one. See, I'm hip. I know all this stuff. Car- where's Carson at? I expected her to give me a, a bad look, yeah. But that's what kids believe truth is. But if it's not grounded in this, what they're reading and what they're hearing and what they're believing is truth is not truth. It's all a lie. And it's all part of the grand scheme of the devil to pull them away from the body. Because the future of the church is dead without people like us that come up behind us and that understand why this is important. Understand why it's important to give of time, resources. We have to teach them. See, like Timothy, we live in times of false doctrine and heretical preaching. The cause of Christ, and this is Vance Habner, this is the quote that I had, and I'm going to close here shortly. The cause of Christ has been hurt more by Sunday morning bench warmers who pretend to love Christ, who call him Lord but do not his commands, than by all the publicans and sinners. They say they are evangelical but but not evangelistic. They glory in being disciples of the lowest common denominator. They traffic in unfelt truth and refuse to get excited over religion. Their ideal service is a mild-mannered man standing before a group of mild-mannered people, exhorting everybody to be more mild-mannered. How many nice, comfortable, lovely people rest smilingly in church pews knowing their conscience is drugged, their wills paralyzed, in self-satisfied stupor, utterly unconscious of their, of the danger, of their danger, While the Lord of the lampstand warns them, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. If y'all want that quote, you can read it later. I'm not going to repeat it. But there's a lot of hard-hitting stuff in there. A lot of stuff that convicted me. So I'm going to close with the truth that we know. We know that narrow is the way. We know that narrow is the way. Not a lot of people are going to come to know the saving grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We know that. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be out there trying to share the gospel. Hell is hot. We know that. Hell is hot. But that's not why you should come to salvation because you're afraid of hell. See, Jesus' sacrifice was an act of love. So when we come to know that saving grace, it's because we love him because he first loved us, is what John tells us. Grace is not cheap. Sin is sin. Jesus died for our sins. When we accept the gift of salvation, we are called to be a part of the solution. And here's the solution. We all need more Jesus. To love like Jesus and to serve like Jesus. And remember, Jesus' love wasn't always rainbows and unicorns. Jesus' love sometimes prickled some feathers, prickled some, some of the spines of some of the publicans and sinners. But sometimes it's necessary. Sometimes we have to stand up. We're demanded to stand up. We're called to stand up. That is the truth of God's word. So as the musician comes, the altars are open, 
But it's important this morning that we live in truth. That everything we do is in truth. Tonight, and for the rest of this week, I want you all to come. We'll start in here, I believe, about 6.20 tonight. But I want you all to come. If you're not teaching, if you're not doing anything, just come and hang with the kids and have dinner with them. Maybe walk by the classroom and, and ask the teacher if you can come sit in and just listen. See how these kids are thinking. See what they're thinking. See what their truth is. I forgot TikTok. That's another one out there that people get their truth from. Ah, see, I know them all. I'm telling you. But truth is how we have to live. We have to live it in speak, in speech, and in action. So as the musician plays, altar's open. Uh, all heads bowed, all eyes closed. Come forward if you feel so led.